Hi. <laughs> I want to show you guys something. This, this right here doesn't taste bad, mm, but it's stringy. Um, I have a weird egg yolk story that I'm going to tell you about later, but that's like, <clears throat> I don't know, chicken breakfast pudding. That's what I have right there. It's chicken breakfast pudding for breakfast. And I was supposed to have this eaten by the time we recorded this. It tastes good. Um, I'm going to have to tell you how that one happened. It's hilarious. And it does relate to today's topic, which is, um, it's all about the lessons learned from the food force. I actually just learned an interesting lesson about egg yolks. And it's too hot to eat super fast. So do you guys care if I eat in front of you on YouTube? Mmm, so good. I'm going to give you the recipe for that. Um, but I'm pretty sure the feedback from the redneck is going to be pretty funny. By the way, Tactical, if you're listening to my live feed, there's breakfast on the stove. It's chicken pudding. Mmm. <laughs> Reminds me of the time I put a pizza in the oven. And I had gotten the shredded mozzarella cheese out of my freezer. Um, okay, yeah, I won't let you hear me chew. We uh, we got the mozzarella cheese out of the freezer, sprinkled it on the pizza, put it in the oven, and it's not melting. And it's not melting. And I'm like, I'm going to burn this pizza, and this dang cheese is not melting. Finally, I'm like, maybe it's just like super cheese that keeps its form, right? And it, um, I pull it out and I cut it. <laughs> it was hash browns. So I put hash browns on the pizza instead of mozzarella cheese. I'm a pretty good cook. Uh, but sometimes I make some pretty silly mistakes. And that was one of my favorite ones. So, ooh, looks like, looks like Rebecca made it home from the food forest class. Welcome home, Rebecca. That was a pretty good shot. I think DFW Mike, who's on here, isn't. These are, I'm seeing people who were in the food forest class. Anyway, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the live recording of the Living Free in Tennessee audio podcast. Monday is our biggest show of the week, and we usually talk about how to do different, you know, different things on the homestead or how to self-improve, how to start business, those sorts of things. But today, what I wanted to talk about was just lessons I learned from the food forest install. Yeah, I learned a lot more than I thought I was going to. I knew I was going to learn, but I didn't know I was going to learn that much. Mm. Breakfast custard. <laughs> this is Andy's fault. This is all Andy's fault. Anyway, if you are new to my live stream, I don't usually start by eating breakfast on camera. What we do is we record the podcast as if it's the podcast. If I make a mistake, I'll leave a long silence, whatever. That doesn't happen too often. Yeah. And uh, everybody's talking about the food at the workshop. It was over the top. The oysters in the half shell were like a new experiment, but that might be something we do more often because those are delicious. Anyway, we'll record the podcast. I'm going to talk to you about normal Monday podcast topics. We are going to talk about the food forest, lessons learned from the food forest workshop. And I'll take questions live from people who put them in the live feed. So if you're here on YouTube, put the first couple words in all caps. If you want me to see them, I'm sorry, I'm wearing these like reflecty glasses. My house is still a little upside down from the food forest workshop. And I can't actually find my non reflecty glasses right now. So you're going to get like cyborg Nicole today. Anyway, we'll, we'll do that. There will be a five second pause before we start. Now, if you're new to the channel and like what you hear, do me a favor, subscribe and hit that bell button so you can join us next time we're live. With that, I am going to get into the live recording of today's podcast, starting with a pause. So here we go. Welcome to Living Free in Tennessee, where we talk about building the life you choose on your terms. Today is Monday, October 31st, 2022, and this is episode 647 of Living Free in Tennessee. Happy Halloween, everybody. I'm not in costume. Last year I was. I did have my Cruella wig on over the weekend for a minute, but it just got super weird. Super weird. No, actually, it just got super warm. 
wigs make me sweat. So I took it off and we had a really good time celebrating on Saturday night. And a lot of people were in costumes at the at the Saturday night festivities at the Food Forest Workshop, which was also my birthday party. So some people came in from offsite for that as well. So anyway, today is the first day after the Food Forest Workshop. You can hear my voice is a little scratchy. <clears throat> I'm sure it had nothing to do with the singing that happened Saturday night. That was fun. It was like live karaoke on Saturday night because we had some musicians there who could play just about anything we threw in front of them, which was pretty fun. Mm. If you hear me saying, mm, I'm eating breakfast while I record this because I accidentally made breakfast pudding today. I'm going to explain that recipe. Yes. To the person who asked, am I sharing the recipe? <laughs> yeah, I'm sharing the recipe. Anyway, it's the first day after the food forest workshop. So we will be doing, I'm going to talk to you about lessons I learned from the food forest workshop, everything from what we learned, you know, tree tr trimming tree roots to shucking oysters, as well as a couple of other more esoteric things. Before I do that though, I want to thank today's sponsor. And that is Paul Wheaton of Wheaton Labs and of permies.com. Paul Wheaton has been doing a Kickstarter for what he calls the Garden Master Course. It's taught by he Helen Athau. I don't know how to say her name. You think I would know this by now. Anyway, she used to teach the Master Garden course, which has a certain amount of required segments on chem ag. And so she took it. She is a master gardener who has learned permaculture practices. And she has changed the coursework around to be tapping into your existing um ecosystems to using nature to fight pests and and losses and diseases and to make a healthy more sustainable approach to growing vegetables anywhere from the backyard kitchen garden to commercial commercial gardens or also food forest which is interesting because we did a food forest this weekend anyway he's been doing a kickstarter for that there are 11 days left and the more he pre-sells this video course the more perks you get if you support it. So I've got the link in the show notes if you haven't decided to. At $50, you get the unedited course that she's already taught. If you go up to 80 bucks, you have an edited version. So they cut out some of the excess stuff. And then there are a bunch of levels above that. Every level you get additional perks, just like the Kickstarter I did for my coffee. If you want to learn more about it, there's a link in the show notes. Or you can also go to YouTube if you're watching this live. And I just put the link in the comments if you're interested about that. It's also in the in the actual notes of the YouTube. Next, I want to tell you our live stream schedule for the week, 930 tomorrow morning. I'm doing the Wednesday live. Oh, wait, it's the first Tuesday fireside chat, right? So Jack Spierko will be on with John Willis and me tomorrow at 930. And we'll be talking about whatever strikes our fancy. If you had fortunes to send to me, like Chinese fortunes that we read on air. I have a few queued up, but not a ton. And I'm not going out to Chinese food tonight because I'm eating breakfast custard for, you know, chicken breakfast custard. Mmm. What a funny thing. It was so funny. It was like, I started the live stream late for the people on the audio podcast because I had an unfortunate incident with egg yolks and it resulted in what I'm eating now. So that live stream will be 9.30 Tuesday right on YouTube. I will also stream it to the SOE YouTube station as well as the Survival Podcast YouTube station. The other live stream this week is going to be <laughs> Friday, 9.30 in the morning, our usual homestead update, uh, update followed by the Q&A session. If you're listening to the audio podcast and want your question to be on the Friday show, send it to me at email. Nicole at livingfreeintennessee.com or go to livingfreeintennessee.com, click on show notes and fill that out. Anyway, that is the live stream schedule. I do have an interview I'm doing this week that we'll publish on Sunday, but we're not streaming that one live. So you're gonna have to wait till Sunday to listen to it. I also wanted to mention that next week I will be in Dallas, Texas with Jack Spierko of the Survival Podcast, helping him get ready for his fall workshop, which is a very large event. And I will not be producing shows next week. So Sunday is the last show I produce, except did you know that there was a lost episode of Living Free in Tennessee? Yep. 
I lost an episode about two years ago, one that was recorded and I thought I produced it and then it was never produced. And then I thought the audio was gone forever. I found that episode. So the lost episode will publish next week. That's the only original episode you're getting. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but don't miss the Living Free in Tennessee lost episode next week while I'm at Jack Spierko's. Of course, I'll be back the Monday after that, probably sounding much like this because I will have talked all weekend long and we will do our next usual Monday show. With that, it's time for the first segment of a Monday show, and that is Tales from the Prepper Pantry. This is where we talk about storing what you use and using what you store. And I'm sitting here on my desk and there's these pouches of freeze dried food on my desk. I have two pouches, lunch meat and blueberries. I freeze dried these because when I travel, it's really handy to have snacks that, that I want to eat instead of buying food along the way. And those are queued up for me to pack when I go to Jack Spearco's, I will add two more pouches to that of freeze dried chili. And that is what is in the freeze dryer right now. I am freeze drying some leftover chili from the workshop. I'm actually surprised we had leftover chili, but we did. So I threw it in the freeze dryer with some guacamole this week. I'll bag up a couple of servings of that. I like to travel with a couple of servings of things wherever I go because I have a weird allergy that isn't always easy to accommodate. And so if I'm somewhere and I'm at a restaurant, for example, and they can't accommodate that, I can just throw hot water on the food. I have food that I am not allergic to with me and it works. And that's all about taking responsibility for your allergies. I had, I had somebody here this weekend who has some allergies and she had brought her own food and left it at her hotel. And, um, you know, I was like, you should just bring it here. She's like, well, I didn't want to impose by asking for hot water or whatever. And I was like, we don't care. You can totally like we'd like to tr we'd, we'd like to not kill people here. General rule. And if you have an allergy, you need to bring your own food. I don't feel like you're dissing my food. And hopefully people don't feel that way when I have my little pouches of food. But that's one thing that having a deep pantry really helps you with is you have you can have ready to go things. You don't have to have a food freeze dryer to do it, though. You can just dehydrate food or you can buy things and put them in the packages depending on how much or how deeply you get into food preservations. At the workshop, we served leg of lamb, salsa, pickled things, squash soup, chicken, and a whole bunch more all coming out of the pantry, which is one of our goals when we do events here is to try to feed people as much of what we, we produced here. And the food was delicious, as people in the comments are saying. The uh, I try to make the food del as delicious as possible. You know, sometimes things aren't as good as people think they're going to be, but usually they're pretty good. And uh, the one thing we served that I did not produce here was lettuce. I usually grow the lettuce for the workshop. That didn't happen this time because the schedule in October was fairly aggressive. And I just didn't feel like I could put the time in to that. Watercress is at the perfect harvesting age. I've been looking at this patch all week going, I really need to get down there. I really need to get down there. I really need to get, today I'm going to get down there. I'm going to harvest some watercress and I'm going to do that because soon it's going to hibernate for the winter. Once we start getting regular frost, it pulls itself underwater and then waits until it's warmer again to poke up again. So what I usually do, I try to have fresh watercress salads when it's in season, like right now. They say it's a liver cleanse. I am not making a med medical re recommendation. But I do know when I was exposed to toxic mold, I was really craving watercress. So we do that. And I figure, you know, when things are in season, that's that's when you eat them, right? There's a reason for that. So then the next thing is that I harvest it right before what looks like a deep freeze, put it in my free fridge. It'll last about a week in the fridge. And then I also will chop it up and freeze a couple bags of it to put in soups and stews because you can you can either make watercress soup, which I have a recipe for that, or you can put it in soups and stews as the greens. And so it's just another way to have, you know, some green bulk for, for things that you do. So that's all happening right now. We have another round of mint to harvest. So we had a freeze coming in and the mint I was pretty sure was going to get beaten back. And it did. When we had the freeze a couple weeks ago, 
the mint totally was burnt looking after that. But because we've had nice weather since then, it came back. So I'm going to do another round of harvesting mint because I like peppermint and chocolate mint tea. I served some chocolate mint tea at the workshop to, for people when it was a little cold at night. And that really, it's nice to be able to tap into the mint we've grown here and not have to ship a bunch in from the grocery store. I always will buy it at the grocery store if I run out though. So I'm going to get another round of that gathered this week before I go to Jack's. And then I just dry it at room temperature. I put it on cookie sheets and let it dry inside my house. And then I take the leaves off the stems and put it in jars. And that's how I store that. We're starting meal planning for while I'm away, because what usually happens while I'm away, here's the deal. I'm running a homestead with another person. That other person does less cooking than I do. They can cook, but they do less cooking when I do. When I'm gone, they also do all the things I do on the homestead. And so I often find out at nine o'clock at night that dinner has not been had. And so we've started like having a little meeting before I leave about meals. I usually cook a big stew. So there's leftovers for a few days, but just about what can be cooked quickly and queued up and where to find it. Because I, I know where things are in my freezer and my pantry, but not, and my mom does, but the two rednecks don't. So we're going to have sort of a little like, what do you want to have? There's seven days of food you need to cook while I'm gone. It'd be good. You know, you think about what you want for dinner in the morning when you get up and it's a crock pot meal and you put it in the crock pot meal in the morning. If you work till seven o'clock or six o'clock or eight o'clock, however long you work, uh, it's ready to go in the crock pot. If you start thinking about at eight o'clock what you're cooking for dinner, you might not eat till midnight because you're heating it up on the stove and bada, bada, bada. And that's how we get out of, out of sorts. That's why it's nice to think about what you're doing tomorrow in advance so that you're not catching up. That said, on more than one occasion, I have ended up at six o'clock going, what am I cooking for dinner? And when that happens, we eat late. Although freeze-dried freeze -dried hamburger saved my bacon last week, right before the event. So we'll be doing that this week. And then I wanted to mention something I think is really funny. So I live in the country. We cook almost everything from scratch here. And I don't go out to eat very often because I have to drive 25 minutes to get to a restaurant. And then you wait for them to cook your food. And then you eat your food. And then you drive 20 minute, five minutes home. And by the time I've done that whole thing, I usually could have just cooked, eaten, been done with it. And I'm in my PJs, whatever, you know. Well, now this has changed. There's a marina by my house that's always had restaurants that aren't good for 15 years, bad restaurants. So every coat so often I would give it a chance and I'd go over there and then it would, you know, I would be like, wow, yeah, not going back there. But they always have new owners every year. And then this year, what's happened is a Mexican restaurant is there now. That's new. That's It's always been sort of like marina food, burgers and steaks and hot dogs and nachos, right? part of why it's not good. <laughs> I had some of the worst like moldy stale bread once there on a sandwich. Oh, it was disgusting. Anyway, there's Mexican place there now. And I was like, okay, everybody's saying it's good. So I give it a chance. I go there and it's, it's a good Mexican place. It's not like super high end Mexican, but it's like reasonably tasty Mexican food. So now I'm going out to eat once a week because once a week I'm like, I can just drive five minutes and go eat. So I need to think about how that works in the like grand scheme of my life, because the cool thing about not going out to eat all the time or regularly is you don't spend the money on going out to eat because a meal I cook here is a lot less than the meal I buy, even at a Marina Mexican place. Right. But at the same time, sometimes it's nice to just not cook. What that means I'm doing just from an operation independent standpoint is thinking like, is the number twice a month? I was going out to eat about once a month anyway. Is the number once a week? How much space do I want to make for those days when I just don't want to cook and I go eat? Or do I plan it and it's a special treat? So I'll be thinking about that in my future. I'm taking a bite of food for those of you on the audio podcast because my next story is about what I'm eating right now. I usually eat breakfast before I record this. And I started cooking breakfast and I realized there were no eggs in the house. And that's because we just had the workshop and our ducks are on strike. 
And so I was like, hey, Tactical, go check in the coop and see if there's any eggs. I'm like, wait a minute. I have bowls of egg yolks in my free fridge. I'll just cook egg yolks. I'll do scrambled egg yolks with some um, with some of the chicken left over from the workshop. Sprinkle a little cheese on it. It'll be like a cool little scramble. So I get the egg yolks out and I'm like, why are they floating in yellow watery stuff? They're floating in lemon juice because we made hollandaise sauce at the workshop and there's leftover hollandaise kits. There might already be melted butter in there. I don't even know. And so I like put my finger in and taste it to see if it's lemon juice because I couldn't tell by smelling. Sure enough, there's lemon juice. So I like I strained the yolks. I strained them and put them back in a bowl and I whisked them with a fork with some salt and some pepper. It turns out that when you do that, it's a very thick thing that comes out. And I was like, wow, I probably should add some milk to this. Those of you who know how to make hollandaise sauce know what's going on here now or know how to make a custard. I probably should add some milk to this to make it a little thinner because it's super thick. So I add some, some raw milk to it. And it's, it's about the right consistency for when you're doing scrambled eggs. So then I saute up the chicken. I pour the egg yolks in and I ended up with this like pudding. I basically made pudding this morning, egg yolks, milk, there's probably butter and the, the acid from the lemon juice had penetrated the yolks enough that I made a custard. And so now I have this weird bowl of pudding that tastes like chicken and eggs but it's pudding. So I'm eating it with a spoon right now. And the, and the amount of time it took to cook that was roughly 20 minutes. And I was expecting it to take five minutes to because it takes five minutes to, to cook eggs. So I was going to cook eggs for five minutes, eat them, come in here and record. And uh, that's my funny egg yolk story. So apparently if you soak eggs in lemon juice and you add fat and you whisk that up and you cook it, you end up with egg pudding and not <laughs> <laughs> not scrambled eggs. So it's not what I was going for, but it's actually, this egg pudding is pretty delicious. So I might do it another time. Like if I just had dental work, it would be perfect. Sort of a softer egg thing. And it gets me all the nutrients I'm going for. But these sorts of things happen to me. So it was a total mistake. And now it's going to be in my cookbook. Lastly, I wanted to talk to you about black garlic. A couple weeks ago on the, I guess it was a week ago on the Homestead Happenings Update Somebody asked me about black garlic, which I've only read about. I've never tried it. I've never made it. And I said it takes 40 to 50 hours. I am wrong. It takes 30 to 50 days. Okay. So what you're doing is you're taking the garlic and you're holding it at a, at a certain temperature. And over time, it tur turns black. The minimum time is 30 days. Other people like to let it go longer. And somebody heard that episode who listens to the podcast and mailed me a garlic fermenter. So we're going to start some fermenting. I'll do some videos about how to do it. And then, it, and then you you all are going to forget that I even had that episode or talked about it. And then 50 days from now, we'll taste it. So I'm looking forward to that. We'll be making black garlic. I, I have a ton of garlic here, so I'll be freeze drying some. I'm planting some. I'm going to make black garlic and then I'll store the rest for garlic use throughout the winter. My garlic usually lasts into June before it starts growing again in, in sort of my root cellar storage. And I grew so much garlic this year that I have a lot of garlic. So in order to keep that trend going, garlic is one of the easiest things to grow. It doesn't take a lot of space. Like you could grow 40, 40 heads of garlic in a relatively small space. You could do it in a container the they say to give it a lot of space but you can give most garlic like a diameter six inch circle around each planting so that helps you kind of understand how much space it takes and if you plant it closer it's it's just not going to get as big in the bulb but this is something that if you want to make yourself self-sufficient in in, a, in an area, you could make yourself garlic self-sufficient by figuring out how much garlic you cook with in a year. And if it's one clove a week, you need, you know, 52 weeks in a year, 52 cloves of garlic. That means you plant 52 garlic teeth. That's like the, the piece of the clove of garlic and or bulb of garlic. And if they all live, then you are 100% garlic self-sufficient. If you only use 
a head of garlic like every two weeks, you only need half that amount. You see how that works? So garlic is so easy to grow in many climates, not all. You can totally container garden it if you want to, or you can make a patch in, in your field. You want to loosen up the soil. And then when you plant it, you put four, about four inches to six inches of mulch on top of it. It can be leaf mulch. It can be straw. It can just be straight up wood chips. It likes nutrients. So if you're going to do straight up wood chips, I would put manure or something under that that can add a little fertility to the soil. And, and you just let it go. You want to keep it weed free in the spring. You go out there and look, you start seeing weeds coming up through the mulch. You get those out, you mulch it again. And then here we start harvesting our garlic in June. Some places it's not till July or August. It just depends where you are. Once it's harvested, you let it cure for two weeks. That means don't wash it, harvest it, leave the stem on if you can, lay it out in a dark place or a place not getting direct sun, preferably. So I actually, it gets light. I do it under my, under my roof outside. You can build racks and hang it, or you can just lay it out so air can get around it. What happens during that time is the very outer layer of the garlic goes from something you peel like a banana to that papery stuff that you pull off garlic. And then it's ready to store. Then you cut the stems off. Just don't wash. I never, I will knock the dirt off but I don't like hose it down unless I'm selling it to somebody who wants clean looking garlic. So I usually store it and it's got a little bit of dirt or dust on it. I don't worry about that because before I cook with it, I clean it. Anyway, you, it's very easy to become garlic, garlic self-sufficient once you know how much to grow. And then in Tennessee, elephant garlic, which is really in the onion family and it's not garlic, but it tastes like garlic. It's perennial. So you, if you plant one and never harvest, it will propagate itself and end up you end up with this patch of elephant garlic so that's something i'm actually going to go back in my food forest and be adding elephant garlic here and there just because it's nice to have around when when i in the years where i've done poorly growing garlic i've always had the elephant garlic and the elephant garlic is in the yard and i can just run out harvest it right away and use it in fact if you don't cure your garlic in june when you harvest it, you can still cook with it right away. There's no reason. The only reason you're doing that curing step is for, is for storage, long-term storage over the winter. And if, if you use it, you'll find out what it's like to peel garlic, like a banana, instead of just taking that papery thing off. So you'll just notice that difference, but that's the only difference. It still tastes delicious. And uh, I don't know. I just love garlic so much. Next segment is the weekly shopping report. No weekly shopping report. I didn't see one up on MeWe. Let me look right now and make sure. But sometimes Joe doesn't post it till a few days after Saturday, depending on how his schedule is. So there will be no shopping report this week. But hopefully he will be back next week with the shopping report. And we'll just read that on the podcast, right? Okay, next segment is the frugality tip. And it's not from you, Margo. I see that you are in the comments and you think you need an acre of garlic. The, the frugality tip actually comes from Alan. And he says, this is one that many people often overlook, including himself. And it's this. When you have a problem, don't assume it's too complicated or you won't understand. And you know what? I would say don't don't assume that when somebody tells you what your problem is and it doesn't make sense to you or what the fix is and you're like, I'm not following. Because a lot of times when you come to a new topic and there are vocabulary words you don't really understand, taking the step of learning the vocabulary words gets you a long way down, down that road of understanding it. So he's absolutely right. Google what you need to do or go on YouTube and look at it and see what the repair for the problem you need to fix is. It might be easier than you think. Try asking the question with more detail or fewer details. And that sometimes helps you get an answer. For example, when your dryer is making a noise or your refrigerator is oozing water everywhere. <laughs> I totally spent a year doing this. Um, or your mower is not starting or your faucet is dripping, you might find that fixing it's actually pretty easy and easier than you thought and a whole lot less expensive than replacing the whole thing. That's the frugality part of it. 
what you need to do when you do this is look at how much time and money am I spending repairing it versus how much does it cost to replace it and does it make sense? You may look into it and realize that you, you need some help and then you'll be better versed in finding the right kind of help and assessing the quality of the help and you'll be better informed to make wise decisions or you may find out that you can fix it. So I think that's a pretty good frugality tip for the week. Thanks for that one, Alan. If you guys want to send me a frugality tip, because these are all, all sourced from the audience, from you, you people who are listening to me right now, send it to Nicole at livingfreeintennessee.com. And I think you heard earlier how to use my contact form. So I know you know how to do that. With that, it's time for the next segment, Operation Independence. This is where we talk about building local ongoing revenue into our lives. And this really started because I needed to transition off a more corporate style job. So the food forest workshop is over and I made a lot of money, right? Right? No, I spent $2,000 on that. And it's, you know, people hear that and they're shocked. I'm not shocked at all. Um, we sold, we sold, we didn't sell all 20 tickets. We had 20 people there. And some of those people were staff, right? So because I didn't sell 20 tickets, I didn't break even on that one. And I kept the the student count low on purpose because A, I, I was coordinating it and wanted to have a manageable group size just two weeks before Jack Spierko's workshop, which is a much big, bigger group. And B, because I knew we'd be standing outside with class instruction. I either was going to have to amplify Nick or we needed a small enough group that they could all see what was going on. And that worked out well. So if I had sold out, we probably would have broken even. But here's what I see. I got, I spent $2,000. And had I done the Food Forest install without doing a class, it would have cost me about $2,000. So I spent the same amount of money I was going to spend anyway. Two, I have a lot of great new relationships because the students came there and we spent time together because, you know, there was a lot of time around the, the campfire. There was a lot of time over meals that we could talk. There was time in the morning, like we sort of started a little later in the day than we could have just so we had time to talk over coffee. Because what I think is really important about events is getting to know people. So that was great. And I have a food forest now, right? I have 15 fruit trees that will give fruit for me or my livestock or whoever to resell over the next few decades. And it's a long-term food forest that's not likely to be chainsawed down unless I die and sell this, you know, this place gets sold to somebody who hates trees. Plus there are a lot of other benefits of the food forest that you'll hear later in the episode. So while that is not something that earned me money, I think the long-term value of that $2,000 is well worth it because a lot of seeds were planted both from a networking standpoint and a relationship standpoint with people, as well as seeds, actual seeds planted on my property that are helping to move this towards the long-term vision. The other thing is I am headed to Jack Spierko's next week, and that's a whole nother chapter. So we'll we'll jump into that and and talk about that probably right after I get back. Woohoo! Now it's time for the main topic of today's show and the reason you joined, and that is lessons learned from the food forest installation workshop we did this weekend. We have been wanting, I have been wanting in a food forest here for probably 10 years since I first figured out what a food forest was. My first year here, the first thing I did when I moved in before I knew anything about anything was plant trees that are now dead, fruit trees. I have one tree out of that that lived. And it, it's because I didn't really know what I didn't really know. I had planted trees in Portland, Oregon, and this is a totally different climate than Portland, Oregon. I didn't look at my soil quality. All I did was say, I know what you do when you move to the country. You plant trees because it takes five years for you to get fruit. So you might as well plant them now. And then five years from now you have them. And there was a lot to do here. But, you know, putting three to five trees in was no big deal. So I did that. It was a failure, but I did it. Except for that one pear tree. I have an Asian pear over there that actually has given me fruit. This year I trimmed, or last year I trimmed it way back. So it didn't give it to me. But next year we'll be back to getting fruit from that one. And then I learned about permaculture after homesteading here for a while. And then I realized I had made a lot of decisions that it's not that they were wrong. 
because I always say I made the wrong decisions. I made decisions that slowed my progress to the vision for this property by not knowing what permaculture was simultaneously while I was trying to invent a new way of setting up your homestead that was basically permaculture. I was trying, like in my head, I knew that there should be a way for one system to feed another to feed another and to re return your surplus to the system and to have your homestead work for you rather than you work for your homestead, right? And I called it modern homesteading. And the funny part about it is I was trying to invent permaculture. And then I learned about permaculture. I was like, great. People who know a lot more about plants and hydrology and the you know, ecosystems and animals have spent many years perfecting this design science called permaculture. And now I don't know what to do. All I know is <clears throat> it's a lot of work what I'm doing right now. So I brought in Nick Ferguson to do a half day consult. And part of that discussion starts with what are your goals? Goals in life, goals for the property. What do you want to do here? How much time do you want to spend doing it? What do you eat every day? What kinds of meats do you like? What kinds of vegetables do you like? What does your property look like? Where are we at? How much, again, how much time can you put into this? How much money do you have? Because if you don't have time, but you have money, you can knock out a whole bunch really quickly, right? And I found, and because I was lucky because I had him for half a day, but I also had a guest cabin at that time. And so he was doing a tour of consults. He ended up sleeping here. So I had him at dinner time too and could talk a lot more about just the lifestyle part of designing your property. And I think this is something that is often overlooked in permaculture plans. You hire an expert. They don't really understand your lifestyle as well as they should. Not in all cases, but some. Most permaculture people know better than do this. Like the good ones know better, right? And they come out and say, you should do this, 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 and this. Having not assessed first, what does this person want to be when they grow up? What does this family want to be when they grow up? How much time can they put in? Do they even eat fruit? Like we go to these buzzword things in permaculture, plant guilds, food forests, swales, you know, hugo culture, hugo culture. Woo! Um, and we do that without assessing because it's really cool to read about it, right? You're like, ooh, I'm going to do all the guilds all over my property for the rest of my life. And nothing will get planted without it being part of a plant guild and very well thought out. Well, does that really work with your reality? It's an important question to ask because sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes you really just need to put in a monoculture peach orchard or a peach orchard with maybe some things planted underneath it that help with pests. But it's straight rows of peaches because you're going to be driving up and down those roads, rows, harvesting the peaches and selling them at your, at your market stand. And if you have a peach, a bunch of peach trees that are hard to get to that yield less because you're not carefully nurturing optimal yield, your whole business is, is messed up, right? There are different reasons to do different things. And you can, when you think about it from the big picture, then you know what to do. And that the reason I'm telling you this story is I'm 15 years in on my homestead and this is the year I planted the food forest. And I knew in January I was ready to put the food forest in. I had an idea of where it would go. I had Nick out for another consult just because he's come through, you know, time after time when he's passing through. I'm like, OK, I'll pay you for a half day or a full day or whatever. Let's go back through and see what the next step is. Because there's a big picture plan, but you have a big picture plan and then things change or realities of your property are different than we thought they were before we put the goats on it to eat the underbrush so we could see what was really under there from a topography standpoint, right? And he agreed it was time for the food forest and he wanted to put it somewhere slightly different where, than where I wanted to put it. And that's why I bring consult consultants in because I'm very close to my land and I have some preconceived notions about things. And when I thought about his suggestion, I was like, yep, that's about right. 
come to think of it, that does make sense as long as we don't block access, right? And so my my food forest is designed to not block access in some, like I could have put a lot more in, but I want to be able to drive some specific places other people might not want to drive on this property if they were living here because I don't want to carry 120 pound bags of green coffee beans. That's like a giant sandbag on my back or in a wheelbarrow everywhere. I'd rather be able to drive it to storage and drive it from storage to my roasting shack, for example. So since my first food, food con, my first consult with Nick, here's what's changed on the property. One, my roasting business has a standalone business and, a, and we're storing uh, in another building. Okay. Those weren't even there by Martinson family. The other thing that's changed is I had a hydrology issue that's different than what most people talk about in permaculture. It's, I think they just don't talk about things like this because when we talk about permaculture, we're often thinking about the plant and animal part and not the human habitation part. Except for Paul Wheaton, who does a whole bunch on like maximizing your, your, your permaculture living space. Right. And I hope the stove's not still on. Tactical, is the stove still on? I smell something burning. Um, so I, I'm just going to leave that in the podcast too, because that's my life. <laughs> it's my life the day after work. I get a little, I'm a little batty the day after a workshop. What was going on here is I was in a house that was pretty well insulated because it's built into the side of the hill, but I had a bad problem with water getting under my house, which there isn't much under my house, like no, not much space. And I kind of knew the problem was there and I thought I had remediated it, but it was not all the way remediated. Right. And the process of fixing this issue was not a cheap thing. So when we talk about a type one error, that's in permaculture. That's when you put something in exactly the wrong place and it's going to cost more money to move it than it did to put it there in the first place. That sort of mistake is not something you want to do. That's why sometimes it's better to move slowly. And I didn't build this house, but this house was here. In hindsight, it might not have been a bad idea when I moved here in 2007 to bulldoze it and change how the house worked and rebuild a totally different house. It wasn't in the budget, but it might have been a better plan. And, you know, some people told me that when we came in. But what what happened or what changed is I, I finally had enough of the right kind of contacts, access to equipment, and some money to put into it to fix the problem where the water is going under my house. As a result of that, the entire shape of the land surrounding my house immediately has changed. And, oh, that's, I'm, I have it on the cleaning cycle in the oven. Now I understand. Hopefully he didn't turn that off. Um, I also knew that one of the things I really want to do because I'm a natural teacher is have workshops and events here. The, one of the things I'm best at is breaking subjects down to, into understandable pieces for people. And I've, it's been that way my whole life. Just, it's a natural thing. And this property, if you would have come here 15 years ago, was not super well built for teaching. It wasn't like, this is where I can put an event center. Uh-uh. No, a lot had to be done. And we finally have a decent event space ready to go. And it's taken years to put together. Also, because it took me a while to be able to wrap my head around where, the where of it and the flow and the money. It takes money to do this. So we've We've got a whole bunch, uh, you know, just cycle after cycle of, don't worry about turning the oven back on. I'll deal with it afterwards. Cycle after cycle of event. And every event has worked well here. But every event, there's a little bit more in the infrastructure column put together to make them a little bit better from a teaching standpoint. And until Taj Mahal went up, and it went up in February of this year, I was not ready to put a food forest in that I might have to take back out because I didn't know for sure we weren't putting a second structure right where the food forest is for classes, for people, you know, air conditioned, heated, all that stuff. 
because we do outdoor classes here mostly. And that confines what time of year I can do it, right? So I knew we could put in the food forest this year, but it took us that long. And, and I'm telling you this story because if you have a new property or you have a property and you're new to permaculture or you haven't put your food forest in yet and you're like, I need to get it in, you might need to get it in. It might not be time yet. It might not be time yet. And you can put fodder trees in and they're not very expensive and it's not super painful if you have to remove them again, right? Because it's easy to propagate those. But if you spent $500 on fruit trees and other things that you put in and they've been growing for 10 years and then you realize that's in the wrong spot, it's kind of a bummer because while you can propagate those trees, they're just coming into their own. You know, they've, they've been giving you fruit for five years, maybe, unless you started them from bare root and, and, and little ones, you know, like I got more mature trees to go in mine because one of my goals is to have production sooner and waiting. And if waiting another year gets you to where you're confident, that's going to be where it needs to be. Or if saving enough money to pay a consultant like Carrie Brown or Nick Ferguson or Billy Bond, or I guess William Bond usually does their consults, or anybody else who can come give you that outside eye, Cliff Davidson in, in Tennessee. He just did a consult for a listener and she loved it, right? Mike Fertrice is pretty good. I don't know that he does consults, but he does he does good things. That money that you spend or that time that you take can mean the difference between I put it in the wrong place and I have to move it. And it's actually where it needs to be. And that's why I took my time because I didn't really, I, you know, Nick kind of said he always kind of thought it would go where it is. I wasn't confident. He could tell I wasn't confident and it's better to wait until the time is right. So that sets the stage for Taj Mahal was built. I knew where the food forest needed to be. I decided instead of just installing it, no workshop to make it a workshop. And it just so happened I turned 50 this month. And so I thought I'm giving myself a $2,000 birthday present this year and I'm putting the food forest in and we're going to do a workshop. And then my birthday party will be Saturday night and some people will come in from outside for that. We'll have a good time and do this workshop. And as always, I learned a lot of things. I knew... Here's the biggest lesson learned from doing the food forest workshop. I learned a lot more about food forests with this workshop than I have learned at any other workshop or in any of my own research. And I've been to other food forest workshops, okay? Multiples. I learned way more in this one. I don't know if it's because I was motivated to learn because it's at my house or because Nick is a very detailed teacher. <laughs> but... It was pretty, like if we had just, if Nick had just come out and we installed it, I would not have learned the things, as many of the things that we learned in class, okay? And we recorded it, so I'm going to go back and see the video of the sessions I missed because I was doing some event stuff in the background. And and that's good too, like that's also worth, worth its weight in gold that I can go back and look at video of this. The first thing that struck me when I wanted to share with y'all what it is, is that words matter. Because you know who else is a pretty good permaculturist? The tactical redneck. And he's been talking about putting in swales on my property. And I've been saying no for years. And we put in micro swales as part of the food forest about where he wanted to put in the swales. Well, he meant micro swales. He said, Swales, I'm envisioning this giant, difficult to navigate ditch, basically, on contour, like we put in at John Willis's, right? Where they planned access into that, but I didn't, um, I didn't want that here. And I have a fairly steep hill, and I was a little worried about what would happen on, on the, the steepness of grade here, but the, the micro swale in mine makes a lot of sense. And there were other moments where words really mattered as part of just communicating with each other. So we had a good amount of discussion about when we use this word, what we actually mean by it. Like people use the word hugel culture 
to mean putting any wood core in any side bed, size bed. But if you start looking into what Sepp Holzer has done, you will see that he's fairly specific about how and what and scale of hugel cultures, what, what that means for him. And so I don't call a pot with some wood in the bottom and some dirt on top hugel culture. Other people do though. So what do they mean when they say make a hugel bed? Put some wood in? Not necess That's not necessarily accurate. And the cool thing about the microswales, which is coming up in the comments right now, is they made that section of my property more accessible, not less accessible, because there are now some more flat areas to walk through. So it's easier to walk. And that was part of why we did that, right? Because I am not getting younger. And I understand that when we get older, sometimes mobility becomes an issue. And so part of the design, I was like, I don't want to design it for Nicole today. I want to design it for Nicole when she's in her mid eighties. And if I don't get to mid eighties, fine. We've designed it for some other chick who lives here in her mid eighties, whatever. And it doesn't hurt me now to have something more accessible. I'm more likely to go maintain it if I can get there. Part of the hillside garden issue that we were solving when we did that was I couldn't get up there to do anything anyway. Right? So I didn't go there. If it's hard to get to, I'm not going to go there. I'm, I'm inherently lazy as a person. So words really matter. And, and if it's worth it to take the time to understand what we mean when we say plant guild, for example, rather than just get the surface understanding and then maybe misunderstand. That said, if we over rotate on what the words mean and don't seek to understand what the other person means, that's on us right? Because if, if you would just take people literally and not accept that they may be meaning something different, like you behave like an engineer and take everybody literally all the time and not make the effort to understand them, that's also a flaw. That's your fault, not their fault for using the wrong word. So words matter, but with that in mind, Common sense also matters. And Red Flyer Media says, I live in a very hilly area too. Microswales makes a lot of sense and accessible. Yep. The accessibility issue. And the funny thing is, Mike Vertrice, when he first came here, was like, your property could use some microswales. That was like the first thing he said. He was talking about that. And, and I was like, wow, I don't even know what those are. Like, let's talk about microswales. I was still learning about permaculture. I'm still, I am still learning about permaculture. But that's not a was. I I don't think any time in my life will I be able to say that in the past tense, right? But I didn't know what those were. I didn't even, like, for me, when I started permaculture, a swale was a thing you used to shoot water away from your house, not to capture water to, you know, to use it in your landscape. So I use the word swale very differently than other people. And I have one of those swales right outside my window that I put in to move water away from my house because of the aforementioned hydrology issue. Second lesson is trust your gut. Trust your gut when it tells you this food wasn't very good and maybe I shouldn't eat it anymore, but also trust your gut in the following way. I had a gut feeling, gosh, three or four weeks before the workshop that I better have a backup instructor. And so I reached out to Strong Roots Resources, who is on this live feed, and I was like, hey, can you be the backup instructor just in case something goes wrong and maybe you can help along the way, that sort of thing. And he said, sure. And I didn't know why I thought I needed that, but a week, like the week of the workshop, it was not Nick who got sick, but the other instructor on the water project got sick. And it turned out Strong Roots Resources knows permaculture and water stuff. And so that meant it wasn't going to all land on tactical to work on the water. Cause the other thing we did was change how the water works here because the pipes had to be run where the food forest was going in. So we needed to do that first. And I was really glad I had trusted my gut because had I gotten word that an instructor of an important component of this workshop wasn't going to be here and I didn't have a backup plan, it would have been on me to try to teach that. And meanwhile, I'm supposed to be on the food forest side and on the event coordination side. So sometimes your gut guys gives you messages and ignoring them is bad. Likewise, my gut has been telling me for years I wasn't ready to put in swales, micro swales, or a food forest. And I'm absolutely 150% happy 
that I did not try to force this through before this year. Because I would have put it in and I would have been running water lines through it. I would have put them in in the wrong place because there were some hazards or some, some things in the way here that aren't here anymore. I would have made, I would be redoing it anyway. And my gut told me I wasn't ready. And so every time somebody's like, when are you putting your food forest? And I was like, not yet, not yet, just not ready. And, you know, I'd always give an excuse, but really my gut was saying, don't do it, Nicole, don't do it. Um, start with the end in mind. This is something that's true about so many things. Start with the end in mind. I, I'm thinking about a conversation I had at the beginning of this month where the entire discussion never got to the core of the discussion because I did not stop responding to questions long enough to say, what's our end goal and how are we going to get to this end goal, right? And so that the same goes with your permaculture plan. Start with the end in mind. I knew that I wanted to take a round hole and put a square peg in it at this property. I knew I wanted this property to turn into a training property over time. And that it was, you know, not ideally suited from a infrastructure, parking, topography standpoint for that. That said, I can totally illustrate what you can do with challenging topography here. And so that actually makes it a great training place once we get over the, the whole infrastructure thing and that you have to walk up steep hills here. So start with the end in mind and stick to that. It's worth spending more time thinking what the outcome is that you want than you think. The next one is, this is great. This I would have never learned had I not done the workshop. And that's very detailed instructions on how to do root trimming. Now, Nick would have showed me that and I would have thought I absorbed it. But I, A, there's something different that happens when you're teaching a group of people a thing versus one person a thing. And I think what happens is you go into a little bit more detail. Plus, the trees I sourced had some pretty gnarly root things going on where they were like square knots that they tied among themselves and needed to be trimmed. And that root trimming segment was worth the whole weekend because that alone, like how to prepare your trees to put them in the ground and how to plant them in the ground, it took a lot. Of, I think it took us an hour to plant that first tree, maybe 45 minutes. And that was not digging the hole and planting the tree. That was just getting the roots trimmed appropriately, showing how to place them in the hole, how to, you know, like what shape hole to dig, all of those things. And because there was a lot to learn about what you should and should not trim off of roots, right? There were a lot of things in that component that I found extra valuable because it was something I've never done. I've, you know, you know what I've done? I've done what almost everybody does with trees. And that is, you know, pull them out of the pot, identify where the crown is, rinse off the root sums and bloop, in my hole in the ground I have prepared and then make sure I don't bury the, the soil too tall. I've never gone through and trimmed the roots and my trees have lived, but I would have given them a much better kickstart had that happened. And there were a couple trees here that would have lived a while before they died. They would have lived years and then died, but they were going to eventually choke themselves out the way their roots were. That's particularly you know, like in bare roots, it's important to plant it properly, right? But they come with already trimmed roots usually. In a potted plant that's, you know, eight feet tall, it's almost always the case that you're going to find a root gnarl in the pot because the poor thing's been transported in a pot. You don't know how long it's going to be there, right? Even as even if you do it right at from the nursery, you don't it, like it could have been sitting around for six months getting watered and twirling around itself in that pot. So it is a really interesting thing that that we did there. And then tree trimming. So this is dumb. I've read so much about tree trimming. I trim my trees. I learn better when somebody shows me and Nick's a really good person to show. And so he did a whole thing on trimming trees that was like live and in-person trimming trees rather than from a book or a YouTube video. For me, that was huge. That was a huge take takeaway 
right? And with that, I have more confidence in trimming. Plus it's captured on video. So now that video for me is something I can go look at and be able to um, be able to just refresh myself rather than I'm trying to learn this new. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier on the vocabulary, right? You kind of understand the word, then you see it in action, and then you do another pass and you're like, okay, now I understand the word. And then you realize the next week you don't understand the word. And then you go back and you learn it again and you try it. And over time, it's if it's a complex thing, it solidifies the concept. That's the, for me, trimming of trees is not intuitive. For other people, it is. And uh, Red Flyer Media says, I feel like I have the tools to convince my son to use his spare acreage for a food forest. That's great. I Let me know if that goes in. Probably need to do a food forest workshop there too, because that's that's a whole nother region. Probably a whole nother set of challenges. <laughs> I also learned something that nobody covers in food forest classes why you might not install your food forest on contour. Now, if you don't know what that means, on contour, the way Nick described it is picture a lake and how the shore is all kind of jaggly. If the water goes up a foot, that shape changes based on how the elevation of the land is, right? And where it goes up and down. That water line is what we call contour. So that's the exact same elevation along, you know, from point A to point B. Very rarely is that a straight line. Actually, one place on my property, it is a straight line. I think that's because this property was graded um, at one point and put into tiers, like T-I-E-R, not T-E-A-R. Um, where that is, is a place where that happened. And I'm like, that's because somebody graded that. So there's a reason though that you might not want to do it. And so when we did the segment where we started doing the earthworks for my property, what we decided to do was Nick interviewed me like he had already interviewed me, right? And showed how the decision was made about where the food forest was going to go and how it was going to go in. And he interviewed me about how much time I have to maintain the food forest. We knew generally it was going to go in this area and how much production I wanted out of it and other important questions. And one of the things was, I don't, I'm not going to put a lot of time into maintaining this. It's not going to happen. And access is important. So access in a straight line is easier than access in a curvy line. And if you install on contour, you end up with a curvy line. You end up with a lot more edge. So you get more things in and more production. But if access is important and running sheep through there is important, running the fencing in a curvy line is hard. Running the fencing in a straight line is easy. So he said, with that information, I reckon, and because we, you, you tell me you get plenty of water here, I'm less worried about capturing the water and more worried about are you gonna, what you're going to do to take care of this and your access. And I said, yes, but I think over the next decade, we're going to get less rain here. He's like, ah, so you do want to capture some water. What about access? Because you need to get heavy bags of coffee beans through this area. And I said, hold on. A and you need to maintain it then because it's not going to all be with grazing. And I was like, hold on. Tactical, come over here because Tactical is a partner in the property, right? Tactical, what about access? He's like, go on contour. And he, he walks away. <laughs> so we showed how why you might want to make a decision about straight lines. And I drew some straight lines where I'm actually going to drive that nothing is being planted in those areas, right? And then, and then we went on contour and we showed people how to use a laser level to find that out. And the next day we did demos of a water level and an A-frame level just so people could see the different tools that you can use for that. And we ended up putting in two micro soils on contour. And then the other trees got planted along my rock wall garden because I'm already, because it just made sense. Uh, and I also planted some more trees down by the pig pasture in an absolutely straight line with no concern about, about contour at all, because that is exactly the lane I draw through, drive through. So it needs to be straight and not curvy. So we kind of ended up doing a mishmash of things on contour and things for access. 
while adding some additional trees and other, other plants to the whole thing. So, so that I think was important because we do get really focused in permaculture on putting things on contour in putting in, you know, water catchment strategies and those sorts of things. Cause we want to keep the fertility on the land. It does make sense, right? If your, if your fertility just washes off, you're sending that to your neighbor. You might as well keep it here to make your plants healthy and to not have to water as much manually or not at all in, in many places. But I'm using this property for something. I live here. I need to be able to get from point A to point B. So my decision for this was a little bit different than yours might have been on this same property. Then Fred over there is might've been like, so the, the human element and how it's going to be like, I can't stress enough how important that is. The next thing was that we use the statement, don't let the perf perfect be the enemy of the good all the time. Right. Perfect actually equals failure. That was what I was noticing as we were talking about plant guilds and soil biology and all of those things, Nick, Nick did something that many permaculture teachers won't do. He talked about when you might want to actually bring in outside inputs that come from chem ag to balance a system, which is very controversial as opposed to just using all, all like ruminant, et cetera, sorts of inputs. His opinion is he'd rather see you grow the tomato with miracle Grow your first year and have some success and get excited about it and keep growing tomatoes and gradually become the super hyper organic gardener. than start out <clears throat> being trying to be the perfect organic gardener, have a really hard year, not get a single tomato and give up. And, and we kind of talked about that within the context of micronutrients in soil. And then he, he explained how plants access the nutrients. And if you're deficit in any one area, you're hurting the plant. And that, that made me think, you know, actually, when we try to be perfect, which, I, you know, we all aspire to be the best we can. I aspire to that. I'm sure you do. If we get stuck in pursuit of the perfect, we are setting ourselves up for failure. And that goes back to like starting with the end in mind, right? Is this getting me closer to that end or not? And can I make, let's say I want a food force and I want it productive in five years. Perfect would be to source all of the varieties of trees that I exactly wanted and get them as bare root trees, probably, and have everything ready for them and get them in immediately the day they arrived. And that would be my food forest. And in 10 years, I might get some fruit. Well, rather than sourcing the perfect varieties, old varieties, resilient varieties, I bought trees that are eight feet tall not little teeny starts because I want fruit sooner. I bought the varieties that were available to, available to me on the timeline for putting this in with the exception of two trees. And I bought the kinds of fruit I want. So rather than waiting for St. John's super awesome plum from 80 years ago, I got the plums I could get. I got several varieties of plums and I got trees that are more mature so that I can have production sooner. Because my goal is not to have to wait 20 years for this to be mature on a natural timeline. My goal is to get stuff out of this in five years. And I didn't have an, A, I didn't have an unlimited budget to, to buy fancy trees. And, and B, you can't find everything on the, on the timeline you need necessarily, right? So the two trees I'm waiting for, so there are two placeholders right now. I want some sort of old fashioned crab apple because what's available in the store are crab apples that make you a tiny little pea sized crab apple. And my memory of crab apples growing up is that they're the size of a large cherry tomato. Like 
You don't even call them cherry tomatoes. You like those big ones or a little bit bigger. Those are the ones I want. Because if I'm going to have crab apples, I'm going to get crab apples. I don't want pretty flowering crab apples. And secondly, there's a variety of cherry I have wanted to grow on my property for like three years now that I get from a friend named Andy. And he has dropped off, graciously dropped off dormant trees twice now. And I have killed them twice now. And now I have that cherry tree in the place I go most often. <laughs> But it's a placeholder because that tree is not dormant right now. And so I will get Andy trees. I don't know what they're, I don't know what he calls them. I will get one of those in there. So those are my two placeholders because I knew I wanted those specific things. Also in preparation for the food forest, I have been taking cuttings from Jack Spierko and other people for a year and a half. And I have thornless blackberries from Ryan. I have strawberries from Ryan. I have goji from Jack. I have wine berries from me. I've been taking copies of things on my own property. I have, I now have comfrey from like four people that I'm going to put out. And then next time somebody else is putting in a food forest and needs comfrey, I'm going to split my comfrey because I had some here, but not enough to do the whole thing. So I have a lot of variety of stuff that just came from me sourcing things from other people. And if I had let, if I had let the lack of the exact things I wanted dictate the timeline of this, it would have been another three years till I had what I needed for this class. So perfect equals failure. I would not have a food force if I was wait waiting for the perfect lineup of plants. Likewise, we do this to ourselves in our lives, right? We had somebody at this event who is running a business they hate. And they also have another viable business that they like that's going well and their heart is in sort of more the homesteading permaculture place but because they have this successful business they don't really like they don't have time to do the homesteading and and when when i heard that story i'm like i know who you are because <laughs> i had uh, talked to this person before and um i just got a note from that person saying you know what all the way home i'm getting ready to start and i'm going to make significant changes in the next two weeks so that when you see me in two weeks, I can tell you what has changed because I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to do what I love. And, and like, that's because there was a perfect getting in the way of the good there situation. And that's gone. And that's, you know, stories like that make my day. We had perfect weather at this event. And by which I mean, it was cold at night. And I, I you know, I'm back and forth on should I have hung the walls on Taj Mahal or I think I'm going to install walls that are easier to hang. Because I think at nighttime, if we could have retracted some, some walls there and then opened them up again during the day, it would have been nice to hold some of the heat in. Because it was chill. Like the first night it was chilly. We were like under blankets around the fire. And second night, the campfire was warmer than the propane fire. And then the third night, temperature was perfect. But what I mean by perfect is it was warm during the day, but not too warm. You know, like 70s, low 70s. It was cooler in the morning when we were doing classroom work inside. It was cool at night and it did not rain until the food forest was in and then it rained. So I, it like we planted all the plants and didn't even have to water them in. And it was just a pleasant amount of rain for the campers. So it wasn't like I'm floating in a raft and then they left and then we got a whole lot of rain. And I got to see one of the things we did with the micro swale was um, some roof runoff goes into that one micro swale. And I saw it actually do that. So we connected a different drainage thing we had going with that micro swale so that we could shoot water over the other side. And I may eventually do some gentle contouring because it is a, an area we drive through to bring it back towards my, uh, another area where I have some things planted. Um, I think a big lesson was that limited attendance yields closer contacts. And, and I see that Strong Roots Resources, who was there, that's Carrie. This weekend was a great example of what happens when cooperative effort, cooperative effort is put forth. So as a result of the class, something that should have taken one day to put in was by 4 p.m. on day two, not all the way in and not even close. Because we were doing things like spending an hour figuring out how to, learning how to trim roots and dig the proper hole and all of that stuff. And then at five minutes past four, after we had done a lot of learning, 
I started digging holes because I thought, you know what, we're probably not getting the whole food forest in. We're going to get this one micro swale done and that's cool. I'm going to dig every hole I can today while I have motivation and, and, and energy to do it so that tomorrow when I'm finishing by myself the installation of this food forest, I don't have to dig holes because digging holes is the worst. And so I went to the hardest part of my property that I knew was the hardest part to dig a hole and dug that hole first so that every hole after that would get easier, right? I dug enough holes for some people to plant some trees up and then I started digging down in the rocky clay. And, and I just like concentrated on digging holes and I wasn't really looking around. Well, here's what happened while I wasn't looking. All the students were like, we have about an hour and a half of daylight left. And they just like went into full on Hulk mode. It was like, we're going to get all the trees in. And Nick was walking around putting, you know, the, the plant guild plants out different places. And by the time it was dark, Oh, at the end of it, I was on, I was on. So the five hardest holes to dig were, I was three holes in starting on the fourth and Carrie came down cause he had gotten done with that earlier. He was dying. He dug that hole and the next hole. So I didn't have to dig my last two holes. I was getting tired. I was like, I'm taking a break and getting water. Cause I'm like dying right now. And I came back and he was just finishing the second hole, which is pretty darn cool. So I look around and there it's like buzzing of activity. Everybody's having a really good time, super energy. Here's what's going on at five o'clock when we're still working. Oysters in the half shell are coming out. Cocktails are being served, like all of that. And everybody who's like really into the planting part is like, nope, I'm going to wait till I'm done. So they were, they weren't even out there having fun. They were, they were determined as Rebecca says. Yeah, they were totally determined. They're like, we're going to get this in before dark. And they did. We got all the trees in. We got all the plants in that Nick had thought about. The only thing that didn't get planted were some flower bulbs that I had put aside that I wanted to plant somewhere specific. Uh, one tray of rosemary Nick didn't know about. And the the cover crop seeds. And those, you know, like those things... I had the rosemary in by the by noon the next day and I still haven't gotten all the flower bulbs in because I'm still deciding where they all go, right? So it was a great example of how much can get done when a group hits something versus by yourself. Because if we had done it by ourselves, it would have been a very long single day or a single day plus some with four or five people, right? Versus more than a dozen people, they knocked out. So like one tree took us an hour to plant. The other 14 trees, plus a bunch of rosemary, oregano, thyme, uh, blueberry bushes. Uh, Let's see, the grapes are not in because I don't know where I want them yet. Um, I don't remember what all, rose bushes, hydrangeas, like all of that went, and all of the uh, daffodil bulbs because my food forest has some non-edible stuff because I like pretty flowers. So that was another thing. When you do your food forest, you can put non-edible things in there if you like them. And I like to gather cut flowers and put them on my table. And I don't have, I, I get wildflowers, but I've always wanted hydrangeas to be alive here and I've never kept them alive. So I do have one that's alive. That's this big. I managed to eat it through the drought this year. So that they got all the rest of the trees done in an hour and a half. So think about that. If it would have been just like Nick and me planting trees, he would have been doing two trees to my one probably because I'm slow at the root part. And it would have, it would just been hours and hours and hours of work. So that was, that was, and when you, it's kind of like a, you know, they, they talk about the Amish barn raising, like when a group of people get that, that Hulk energy going on a project and everybody knows what they need to do and they're just doing it. It's, it's work, but it's fun. The energy that you generate and we play off each other is super empowering and you can see that you're making progress and you can feel a sense of accomplishment and it's like, we did this. These people are going to come back to my property in two years and see the transformation and be like, I did that. And that's pretty darn cool. And that's where, when, when Rebecca's saying, I'm trying to, you know, convince my son to put in a food forest, right? 
that's why I'm like, do a workshop because you'll get that there. If you do a workshop, it's not so much about the free labor. It's that energy. And just think about all the positivity that is just instilled into those trees and into those plants and into the land. Right. I think, I, I think it's really, uh, <laughs> strongest resources says I gave a pep top to the hydrangeas before I planted them. Yep. Good. Thanks. Um, the, like the po I believe that when we put more positive energy into the world, we get that back. And when that many people give positive energy to your food forest, think what you will about it and that being magic or whatever. I think it matters. It matters if you look at a plant every day and say, you asshole versus right on. I love you. Grow. You can do it. You know, and I, it sounds like it, it, it sounds like a bunch of BS, but I really think it's important. Um, when I think about the size of the class we had, I said at the beginning, like I, I had a few tickets that did not sell. I'm actually really glad they didn't in hindsight because this size for this application was perfect. We probably could have handled two more and still had the same thing happen. But if we would have maxed out for the original headcount I was planning for, it wouldn't have been as good because we would not have gotten to know each other as well. And, you know, I think about the person, there was somebody there who was, pretty new, just, just finished a PDC younger starting out in life and got to come to this class after taking a more theoretical course and see the practical application right at a time in this person's life as, as they're deciding, what am I going to do with this? I know I like permaculture. I know I like this sort of thing. How am I turning that into my life? Right. I would not have known that whole story if I had not had enough time to talk to that person. If we would have had 10 more people, I, I would have had some of those conversations, but certainly not as, as deep. There was somebody here who has a decent sized piece of land in a different zone than mine. And they had this really well thought out permaculture plan that they paid for, for somebody else to give to them. And they looked at the plan and they're like, the next step is to give feedback to the planner, to the designer and come up with the final design. And they looked at that at home and were like, I feel like there's some things I want to change, but I don't have the confidence to know if I'm right or not. You know, like those sorts of things. That person came to this class, got to spend some decent amount of time with Nick Ferguson looking at the plans. Cause Nick, when he's here, he's here, right? Take advantage of that. And I remember at the beginning, this person told me, I really think this, the number of these super tall trees that they want to put in there is wrong for my, for what I want from the property and told me why, right? Sat down with Nick and then, and then told me later, yep, not going to have those trees, you know? And, and it like gave a lens through which to evaluate the plan confidence to when that person now talks to their designer, they can say, okay, I see you put all this here, but my goals are this. So I think we should have fewer of that kind of tree and some of these other kinds of plants or these other access areas. I don't, you know, I'm not going to go into the why on that one. That happened because there was time for a, because we went into the class into a lot of like, be careful about why you decide to do things and what you put where. And cause Nick could also be like, yeah, I see, I see what you're saying there. Um, there were people seeking motivation to follow their passions. I've already told you that story. That person, I it came out of here just like empowered to go do what that person wants to do. And there were a number of people. There were lots of people here who came to this workshop. Food forest is interesting. I kind of want to learn about it. Or I already know everything about food forest because I've been to like five workshops on this. The real reason they were there was to come to Tennessee and find a place or look and decide if they want to live here and meet people in Tennessee. And they did. I think the big lesson is that relationships you make in person are the foundation of all things. And I don't mean like you have to come to a food forest class to have good relationships. I mean, in all parts of life, think about the people who have made the biggest impact on your life and the people you have impacted the most. Most of the time, you know that person in person. It's because of an in-person meeting. And so when you put yourself out there and as a homesteader and a permaculture person who likes to be outside by herself or with a few very trusted friends, 
on her property in the middle of nowhere, it's very easy to set up a personal ecosystem of people that's only a few people you see every day. And if you never leave that circle, you never get influence from outside that circle. You may get a little bit online or by watching something, but you basically never get outside a very narrow circle. When you get outside that circle, by giving yourself exposure to in-person interactions, sometimes you get hurt. But more often than not, what you have are more opportunities that if you notice them, you can help somebody or they can help you or you learn a thing you didn't know before that you really needed to know. And that's important. I learned that I miss rock and roll. Ani and Toby were here. We played music. I'm like, yep, I'm going to be singing rock and roll again. I haven't done it for 15 years, really. I mean, I've sung karaoke, but I haven't like just played in the band or anything. That's going to happen. I don't know how or when or how fast. But that's a piece of me that's pretty important. Even if I just write music here by myself again, write more rock songs and produce them, that's good enough. I do like performing them, though. So that's probably not how that's going to go down. I learned how to shuck an oyster. I've shucked oysters before, but I really learned how to do it this time. Uh, thank you, Ariel, for teaching me that. And also, Steve, from next door. Uh, I'm less uh, timid about shucking oysters, which means we'll probably have more oysters in the half shell at events here because I love those things. Um, plant guilds are not the end all be all. And this is important. This goes back to the whole hugo culture thing where you have a nitrogen fixer, you have an apple and a pear. That's the NAP plant guild sort of thing. So we, we try to put plants with each other that complement each other. So you'll have a nitrogen fixer like comfrey, you'll have an apple tree, you might have a blueberry bush all in its little place and they're all feeding off each other because the blueberry gets a little shade from the tree. The, the um, comfrey plant is fixing nitrogen and actually keeping some more invasive weeds from getting up around that tree and then the tree makes the fruit, which makes the shade. And we overthink it. And we don't plant because we don't have comfrey. And that's an important part because it's a nitrogen fixer, right? 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 Well, Nick actually was like, you know, there's some science here about how much nitrogen comfrey fixes. And it does fix nitrogen. But so do a lot of other things. And if you obsess on that comfrey plant and don't plant anything because you don't have the perfect guild, then what you suffer from is not starting. And if we get the bones of the food forest in and go back through and infill over the next five years some of those plant guilds, you're going to be way further along than if you wait five years to start. And that is exactly how my food forest is going in. Because I didn't have a budget of two or $3,000 for plants for this. I had a bad budget of $500 and that was stretching it. So I got the trees done. I had a lot of people bring me plants. Thank you, people who brought me plants. And I have plants here I can propagate. And so we got the bones in. We got the trees and some bushes and some other stuff in. And over the next three to five years, I didn't buy any strawberries. I've got strawberries growing on the hill right there. Before I leave for Jack's, five or six of those plants will move to different places in my food forest to be ground cover. And then next year when they spread out, I'll split them because strawberries propagate themselves and I will train them over time. Rather than putting in 200 strawberry plants, that even if I pay a dollar a plant, it's $200, right? And I'm probably going to pay more than $200 a plant. So we got the bones in, but not every plant guild is complete, but that's okay. It will grow. And when, when there is something not planted in that nature will plant something there. It's funny how that, how that works. Right. Anyway, I guess last, I want to close on this. Andy makes some pretty darn good eggs. Benedict, he made homemade, he made homemade Canadian bacon and eggs. Benedict, like, it's, it's a rare person who's willing to do hollandaise sauce for a group of people. And Melissa, you made great poached eggs. She was really nervous about that. She did a great job. Melissa also 
can knock out some chili and makes really good German chocolate cake. I think the thing that makes the events here work the most are the people. And that's the staff, the attendees who help, the attendees who come and didn't know they were going to help and end up teaching us stuff we never knew we didn't know. That's what makes them great. That's part of what made the food forest great. And I will always have the memory of this workshop as I watch the food forest grow. And those of you who helped on this, next time you come out, go visit that food forest. You can be proud of what you did. It was a great class. And uh, yes, we, uh, Josie, we will be selling the class eventually when we get it. I don't have it on a quick timeline for production right now because it's a busy fall, but we're putting a video together. We're putting a video series together on that. With that, if you like the show and want to support the work I'm doing here, you can do it in two ways. One, get your Hollerust coffee at hollerust.com. Two, consider becoming a member. Information on that is over at livingfreeintennessee.com. With that, guys, go out. Make it a great week. Remember that time I recorded my podcast and Telegram was giving me notices? Oh, no, it's MeWe. Boop. Okay. I was like, what is that noise? Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this. I don't have any unanswered questions going. So, uh, except for that Rebecca's figured out how to add a big outdoor monitor for everybody to see stuff. Only if it's not raining. Only if it's not raining. Food Forest class was really fun. A lot of you on this were at the Food Forest class, so that was great. Thank you so much. I'm going to be doing a tour of the Food Forest sometime this week when it's not raining outside, just so people can kind of see what the foundation is that we laid. And um, I haven't actually gotten my cover crop seeds out, so I got to do that today because the weather is like, it's giving me waves of rain right now, which is perfect for germination. So <laughs> that's super exciting. Anyway. We will see you tomorrow at 9.30. If you want to see the live stream with Jack Spierko and John Willis, you can join me there. Thank you so much for joining in today.